Today, I'm going to report on a worldwide effort, one that I'm proud to be a part of, that seeks to increase the number of STEM research opportunities for young people. This is, of course, a conference on the future and the future of education, and I see this kind of research engagement as part of the future of education for young people. Then I'll put on my astronomer hat and tie and talk about astrophysics research, the future of astrophysics research. And finally, I'll talk about the future of the Milky Way galaxy and the human and non-human living species it, it hosts. So coming back to this worldwide effort, it's something that started three years ago while I was on sabbatical at Google headquarters in, in Mountain View. I was working with one of my colleagues, Emily Clark. She's at Castellaire School and UC Santa Cruz. And Emily and I started to review what research opportunities, specifically in STEM, are available to high school students around the world. We surveyed a large number of programs. And as we gathered information, a clear pattern started to emerge. We saw that the STEM activities that young people engage in can be put into four broad categories. So the first of these categories is access, enrichment, exposure. This is where a student has access to the researcher, to the people behind the research. They have exposure to research methods. There's often a very complicated path that takes a researcher from the question to the answer. You have access to that. You have exposure to that as a student. And of course, you're enriched by the wonderful results of the research. Mind you, in the media, it's the result that's often reported without the researcher and without the process. So really, the emphasis is on people, process, and result in the first category. In the second category, students learn the important technical skills it takes to do research. These could be laboratory skills in physics, chemistry, biology. But in today's world, the most important research skill is knowing how to program a computer. And in category three, a student takes the skills they've learned in category two and applies them in a controlled, prescripted setting. Here's what I mean by controlled, prescripted. If a researcher has already completed a research project, let's say recently completed a research project, gone all the way from a question to a discovery or result, if they've done that, they can then prescribe to a student what path they should take, because they've already defined a path. It could be a difficult, convoluted path, but they can provide prescription. It's controlled in the sense that if the researcher provides a lot of prescription, then the path of the young person is relatively easy. It's a, it was a difficult path for the researcher, but if you provide a lot of guidance, the young person can go down that relatively easily. It's controlled in the sense the researcher can decide not to provide much prescription, in which case the young person has to go down this convoluted path more or less independently. Now, in category four, open-ended research. This is what most researchers do on an everyday basis. You come up with a question and you try to work towards an answer. But in open-ended research projects, the research mentor and the student are working together to carve out the path for the first time. It's not like the path already exists for the researcher. They're carving it out. Then they're going to navigate that path. So there's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of failure, productive failure, failure you learn from. That is an inherent part of open-ended research. Failure is embedded into category four in a way that it's not embedded into the other three categories. Now, what sets categories one and two apart from categories three and four? There's a very important thing that sets the first two apart from the next two. Categories one and two are offered to large numbers of students today. They're offered at scale. I'll give you an example. Hundreds of thousands of students walk through science museums every day around the world. If you take the aggregate, they walk through planetariums. Researchers go to very large audiences, large school classrooms, and they'll talk about their work. So one person's effort can reach a lot of young people. 
There's virtual engagement as well. I remember when I was a high school student, I remember watching David Attenborough's Life on Earth video series. It's an amazing journey in biology and ecology. Even though that's not the path I chose, it turned me into a scientist. Thinking about the people, the places they work in, and the amazing subjects of their research. Today's uh, kid might watch a Cosmos video series that Carl Sagan put together, that Neil deGrasse Tyson recently remade. So again, the work of a small number of people can reach millions, if not billions of people. Category two is a little harder to scale up, but it's still offered to lots of students at the current time. Um, a researcher can gather a very large number of students and teach them physics lab skills or chemistry lab skills, bio lab skills. There's virtual engagement there as well. I know my child learned how to program a computer by watching Salman Khan describe things in a video on the Khan Academy. There's the nationwide hour of code effort that reaches lots and lots of students. Category two is more hands-on than category one. You have to do things as a student, but it's currently reaching lots of students. I'm not saying it can't reach more. It, of course, needs to reach even more, but it's already reaching lots of students. By contrast, categories three and four require really close mentoring by the researcher. You really cannot take too many students along on a convoluted path. You can't take too many students along if you know you're going to stumble and fall. You can mentor a handful of students at a time, but not hundreds, possibly not even tens. So the only way to offer categories three and four to a large number of students is to have a lot of mentors involved in the process. So that's what brings me to this worldwide effort, this thing called the Global Sphere Network, which is seeking to do exactly that. SPHERE is an acronym. It stands for STEM programs for high schoolers engaging in research early. And it's, a, it's the effort of a group, small group of people. So Emily and I reached out to a few of our counterparts. You know, we were at UC Santa Cruz. We reached out to our counterparts running programs at the New York Academy of Sciences, at the University of California, Berkeley, at uh, the American Museum of Natural History in New York, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and Rockefeller University in New York. So these six institutions got together, founded this network. What this network is, is it's a community of practice for STEM researchers who engage high school students in their work. It's an information sharing forum where you share best practices, templates, challenges, risks, rewards of offering research to young people. You know, it could include things like how do you recruit mentors? How do you retain mentors? How do you recruit and retain students? How do you build up the scaffolding skills for students to do categories in projects three or four? It certainly, these kinds of activities are happening right now. There's lots of research going on. Lots of researchers are engaging high school students, but it's happening in a highly siloed fashion right now. Each program is inventing this for itself, and it's not very efficient because if only all these programs could open source themselves, which is what this network is trying to do, then, you know, we could be much more efficient in our work. All of us who are doing this kind of work can be much more efficient. Most importantly, if a new mentor comes along and says, I want to engage high school students in my work, and I've never done this before, right now there's a very steep learning curve. If these entities that are already doing this can open source themselves, then they can make it much easier, much uh, easier for a new mentor to take this on. So the goals of this network are threefold. We want to foster the growth of the mentor pool. And by mentors, I'm talking about professors at universities like myself. I mean, I'm not the university, I'm the professor. Um, but at, uh, I'm talking about researchers at corporate entities, postdocs, graduate students, even undergraduate students can be mentors to high school students. I want to facilitate the growth of the mentor pool. There uh, is a huge mismatch between supply and demand right now. There's a lot of demand for it, very few opportunities available. So we want to increase the, uh, the supply. We also actually want to increase the demand. Right now, the demand for such opportunities is coming from students who are well-resourced in terms of their homes and schools, and we want to increase the presence of students who are traditionally not seeing these opportunities, not taking advantage of these opportunities. So we want to diversify and grow the size of the intern pool. And finally, we want to make this a one-stop shopping experience so that if the network gathers all of these research programs, it makes it easy 
for a high school student or their support network of parents, guardians, and, and school teachers to find programs that fit the student's geographic needs, the science subjects the student may care about, other logistics like category three or four, housing logistics, finances, transportation. So it makes it easier to shop in one location. So I feel this network and what it's going to do is going to be the future of STEM education. It's going to create a new generation of even better researchers than we have today. And they'll be able to tackle amazing research projects. Speaking of which, I want to say a little bit about astrophysics research next. Um, the astrophysics research world was recently shaken, quite literally, by the detection of gravity waves. The detection of gravitational waves happened in 2015. What you see in the upper right there is the actual chirp signal, C-H-I-R-P, as a, a bird's chirp, but this is called a chirp. This is the vibration of the apparatus, of the LIGO apparatus, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Observatory, detected this incredibly subtle set of vibrations from a pair of merging black holes. That's what's represented in the, in the graphic here. Merging black holes, what they do is they create ripples in the fabric of space-time. These ripples travel away from it at the speed of light, and they were detected for the first time in 2015. Einstein had predicted this should happen 100 years ago when he came up with his theory of general relativity. That's how far in advance of his time he was. But it took 100 years before a direct detection happened. In between, a few decades ago, there's been indirect evidence that systems might be losing energy at just the right rate that uh, you would predict if they were uh, emitting gravity waves, but no direct detection until that moment. That's monumental because for the first time we can hear the universe. We've been seeing it all along, we can hear it now. And um, what happened was the first few of these chirps that were detected, astronomers recognized them as being mergers of black holes, and mergers of black holes don't put out any light. So it's disappointing, you hear it, but you don't see it. Now, in 2017, last summer, a new kind of chirp was heard. This time, the chirp was different, and astronomers recognized in that pattern there wasn't a pair of merging black holes, but it was a pair of dead stars, a pair of neutron stars that were merging. And what's special about neutron stars is when they merge, they produce an explosion, a burst of energy across the electromagnetic spectrum. And indeed, in that picture, that galaxy hosts the pair of merging neutron stars, and the red arrow is pointing to a spot of light that wasn't there the night before. So they saw and heard the same event. And the analogy I think of is you know, astronomy as a human endeavor is like a journey through a beautiful forest, a beautiful but silent forest. It's beautiful because there are all kinds of sights. They're mostly static. You see the occasional movement, but you don't hear a thing because our hearing is not sensitive enough to pick up the sounds of the forest. Until in 2015, someone put on a, an assistive listening device that made our hearing much sharper and with that, we heard the first chirp, and we recognized the chirp was coming from something that doesn't produce light. Even though we turned around to look, there was nothing to see. But after a few chirps, another one came along, and this time the chirp was recognized as coming from a pair of neutron stars. And this time, when we turned around, we saw the proverbial bird fly away. And it's important because we can see and hear now, and we can connect them to the same event. And I see this as the future of astrophysics research. Finally, I want to say a little bit about our Milky Way's future. This is the Milky Way galaxy, this uh, vertical band of gas, stars, and dust. And that little speck in the upper left is, the, is another galaxy, it's the Andromeda galaxy. It's bigger than the Milky Way, also a collection of gas, stars, dust, dark matter. It looks like a tiny speck because it's two and a half million light years away. Now, I've been studying the Andromeda galaxy for decades, but in 2012, I was fortunate enough to be part of a team that made the first precise measurement of Andromeda's motion, all three components, X, Y, and Z components of its motion. And we made the shocking discovery that Andromeda is heading straight, straight for us. Okay, so um, as they say, astronomers wondered why the Andromeda galaxy was getting bigger and bigger, and then it hit us. <laughs> so... Um, that's what you're going to see in the simulation. Today, it looks like this. In two billion years, it's going to be much bigger. And in a few billion years, there'll be spectacular galactic fireworks across the sky. But, and in really, four billion years, five billion years, you'll see. This will put Fourth of July to shame. Right? Um, the trick is to use our ingenuity, young people's ingenuity, to 
figure out how to survive that long, right? So you have to solve the threat of disease. You have to th solve the threat of our environment killing us, other human beings killing us. You have to solve all kinds of things like that. We have to put our critical thinking skills to good use. And if you do all that, there'll be another danger that will come along in 5 billion years. And that is the sun is going to run out of hydrogen at its center, and it's going to bloat up into a red giant. So right now, you can cover the sun if you hold out your finger at arm's length. The width of your thumb is enough to cover the diameter of the sun. But when it becomes a red giant, it'll fill our sky. So the sun will hit our sky, but not like a big pizza pie. It will scorch or engulf us. And neither, neither outcome is particularly good, right? So, <laughs> so we have to use these critical thinking skills, our future generations have to, to navigate our way outward in the solar system, past Mars to one of the moons of Jupiter, so we can watch the sun bloat up without getting scorched, and we can watch the beautiful galactic fireworks. That's where I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you.